Okay, so these are the main five, and I come back to these, uh, the inferences that Darwin made from some of his observations, and I'll come back, I will come back to them in a uh, minute. Darwin, uh, perpetual changes, what Darwin said uh, constantly is changing. A population, unlike Lamarck, a population will not stay the same. It is constantly population is changing, okay, uh, for good or worse. If it is going for worse, of course, extinct, extinction. And I will talk about extinction in a minute. If it is for better, for worse, population will flourish. Okay, that's what uh, Darwin's main uh, premise of Darwin's evolution. The world is neither constant nor, uh, again, these are new things that he mentioned, nor perpetually uh, cycling, but always changing with a her hereditary con uh, continuity from past to present. So he's saying constantly a population is changing. Lamarck didn't say that. Okay. So population constantly changes, whatever population you have. Evidence by fossils, of course. How did he make that assumption that the population constantly changes? Fossil records. And, of course, the collection he collected of the species of the life by drawing or uh, collected. Uh, remnants of past life uncovered uh, from a crust of the earth. Of course, you, you put geology or not, I don't know. There. We are living on the cross. Can be completely remains insects. These are the three ways that fossils are record, uh, fossil records are collected. Okay, by saps of the trees, uh, frozen animals, mammoth, and then um, actual parts of teeth, bones, uh, petrified skeletal parts of infused uh, silicon, and then uh, form cast impressions on fossil excrement. You saw it on the, those videos. The footprints of the animals were uh, on the stones, and uh, that's another way of evolution. Okay, evidence. Um, the evidence is evolution trends, fossil records, allows observation of evolution and changes over uh, broad periods of time. Uh, trends are directional changes in futures and diversity of organisms. Animal species repeatedly arise and become extinct throughout history. Animals constantly came and gone. And I'll show you a picture. I will talk about evolution. Constantly animal comes and goes. Okay? Uh, so animal species typically survive between 1 to 10 million years. Okay? That's what, um, and yes, but their uh, duration is highly variable. Some animals, like, uh, uh, like horseshoe crab, is around for millions of years. Some animals, like us, we are not even we human have not been on Earth for one million, less than that, 300,000 years, uh, whatever they're saying. Fossil, uh, fossil trends clearly demonstrate Darwin's principle of <coughs> perpetual constant changes because of the fossil records, because of the fossil records. Okay, uh, homology, very, very important. I think we talked about homology from beginning of, not beginning of semester, pretty much from sponges and on. I talked about homology, okay? So homology, Darwin uh, saw homology as major evidence for common uh, descendant. We had a common answer in cladogram. I showed you a couple of pictures of cladogram today. So they have all of the species that evolved from common ancestor, the cladogram I showed you picture, they all have something in common. Okay, so I hope I'm making some sense. And that's homology. Uh, Richard Owen described homology, that's a, probably the best definition, and he's giving credit uh, to Richard Owen after uh, Darwin. Uh, the same organ in different organisms under every variety of form on function. That's pretty much the best definition you're going to get uh, for homology. For example, the vertebrate limbs show the same basic uh, structure modified in different functions. Uh, every time a new feature arises on an uh, evolving lineage and new homology forms, homology gets transmitted to all descendant lineage unless it is uh, subsequently lost. Here is the wings, legs of different animals, fins of different animals. They all have same 
homology, same structure. Okay, so I hope I'm making some sense. And that's what homology does. Our leg and bats, wings, so on and so forth. Um, whales, <coughs> horses, frogs. Uh, multiplication of species. Darwin's uh, theory uh, postulated that genetic variation present within a species, as mentioned that, uh, especially between geographically separated population. Now we are getting to area of uh, talking about um, uh, the shift of population. Population, and I will talk about this, always doesn't stay like this. Population changes. What are the causes of change of the population? I will get to it in a minute. Uh, provides the materials from which new species are produced. Branching in the evolutionary trees occur, and I showed you evolutionary trees, right? From common ancestor, branches occur to the present time organisms. Uh, branching cladogram. Branching in evolutionary trees occur where an ancestral species splits into two different species. Total number of species increase in time. Most species eventually become extinct. Most species eventually become extinct. And uh, much of evolutionary research centers in mechanisms causing this branch. That's what, that's what a lot of research is going on now. You go to major universities, they're talking about uh, what causes this branch. Of course, environment is one of them, genetics is another one of them. Uh, what is species? Yes, since I was a student, nobody came up with a good definition of species, but uh, there are speculations. They always, uh, these all, you go to these conferences, they always argue about. What is the definition of species? We do not have a good one. Okay, but a few of them. Definition of species varies and may include several criteria. <clears throat> Members descended from a common ancestor of a population forming a lineage. Okay, we all came from a common ancestor. Interbreeding, we can breed among ourselves. Okay, whatever, let me give you an example. So, you believe horses are a species, right? Interbreeding, let me read. Interbreeding occurs within a species, but not among different species, reproductive barriers. Horses breed among horses, right? And they give off offspring, horses. But if you cross, if you breed a horse with a donkey, do you know what you're going to get? You'll get a mule. So what is the definition of a species. That's because of these examples. And a mule is a dead end. Mule cannot reproduce anymore. Right? Most of you know. Okay, so what is the species? And a horse is a different species than a, 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 a donkey. Hope I'm making a sense. And they give, they give the office things a different species. So that's what um, these are. Um, Oh, genotypes and phenotypes within the species is similar, of course, abrupt, different. You all know what genotype and phenotype is. Should I go over genotypes? The genetic makeup, capital A, small a from bio 1, capital B, small b. Your blood type is the genotype of, if your blood type A, your genotype is either AA or AO. Am I making some sense? You study that in bio 1? If you are blood type B, your blood type is BB, that's your genotype, or your genotype is BO. When you go to a doctor and the doctor asks you what is your blood type, you will not say my blood type is BO. They think you're crazy. They, when you say your blood type, you say the phenotype of your blood type. I'm blood type B. Am I making some sense? But you could be, your genotype could be BO. Right? You don't want to talk about it. Okay. But when you go to a doctor, they ask you what is your blood type, your blood type is O. You say your phenotype. But your genotype is what? O, O. Right? No, no. You've got one O from father, one O from mother, so you are O, O. Your genotype is O. So what is genotype and phenotype within a species is similar. Okay. Abrupt differences occur between... Uh, between uh, I brought between different species. Okay, we'll, I, 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 will, I have a sentence or something about that we'll mention, I will mention. Uh, reproductive barriers, there are two generals. Generally, there are two uh, barriers, uh, pre-mating and post-mating barriers. Uh, important factors, I will talk about those uh, uh, 
pre-mating and post-mating barriers. Important factors in forming new species is called speci speciation. Uh, if diverging population uh, you reunite before they are isolated, interbreeding uh, maintains one species. Evolution of diverging population requires they be kept physically separated for a long time. I, I will go over all of these. Uh, geographical isolation uh, with gradual divergence provides a chance for reductive barriers to form. Okay, there are different type of uh, speciation. One of them is, there are three of them that you should know. Um, one of them has two names, I don't like the other name, non-allopathic uh, uh, species, and I'll, we'll go over that, I will talk about it. But there are three different ones that you should know. The first one that we're gonna talk about is allopathic speciation. Allopathic population occupies separate geographical areas called geographical spe speciation. Cannot interbreed because they are separated, but could do so if barriers are removed. Okay? And I will give you some examples. Separated populations evolve independently and adopt to different environments. Envir environmental changes between populations also can promote genetic divergence by uh, favoring different phenotypes in the separated population. Eventually, they become distinct uh, enough they cannot interbreed when uh, they are united, leads to formation of new species. That's allopathic. Allopathic population uh, species, eventually what happens, you have new species. Allopathic speciation occur in two ways. Uh, uh, recurrent speciation occur when climate uh, or geology causes population or fragments. Um, as you know, Mother Earth, at the beginning, it was all one solid land. Over a period of time, the, the continental shift occurred, so continents separated. So now you had species, you had all of these organisms in one area. Now they are separated like uh, we have kangaroos and wallabies. You do not find them anywhere else on planet Earth, only in Australia. When Australia was separated, then they did not go wallabies and kangaroos. They could not swim, they could not fly. They stayed in Australia only, okay? So that's an example of, um, that's what he's talking about. Uh, I'm curious, climate, climate or uh, geology causes population fragments, causes fragmentation. I talked about ge uh, geographical uh, barriers, uh, the, the shift of the continent. It could be a lot of things. It could be fire. When fire occurs and divides the forest to two groups, except birds, the animals from this end cannot go to that end. The animals in this end might go and migrate even farther, go travel farther, and the animals in this end go travel, and they never come and reunite again. Okay. So it could be a variety of things. Disease could be a different things. Ancestral population can be fragmented, but individual fragments are left intact. Fragmentation can occur in several species simultaneously. You know, we are not talking about only one species. It can be wallabies and kangaroos. They're two different species. Does not induce genetic changes by uh, reducing populations to small size or by transporting them to unfamiliar environment. Okay, founder effect, and I will talk about founder effect a little bit later on, <coughs> occurs when a small number of individuals uh, disperse to a distant place and form a new population. For example, you have a population like this. There are different species, and I will use these markers again. You have these species, they're all in this environment, okay? And founders effect, and I will talk about it again. You have a whole bunch of different species, just a few of them. They will go ahead and go away. That's count, I will, we talk about migration, they're all genetic drift, I will talk about all of that. They're a little bit different. So when these guys travel and go to another part, that's called the founder effect, okay? So that when occurs when a small number, small number, okay, you have a big number, two of them travels and then they go to a different environment and of course they do. Individuals disperse to a distant place, a new form, a new population. Okay, non 
allopathic, I don't like that term. Uh, not too many books use it, but again, you should be familiar with it. It's called non-allopathic. The actual name is for is sympatric. Sim, together. Sim, it means what? Based on your prefix and suffixes. Together. together. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, speciation that occur uh, without prior geographic separation of populations. In what? This is pretty much a lot of parasites that we talked about. This is sympatric population, the speciation. So sympatric species, different individuals within a species become specialized for occupying different components of the environment. The parent, like uh, the um, louse, we have head louse, we have body louse, we have pubic louse, right? They are all adapted to a different environment within the same species. Now you might take that to parasites that evolve and to different organisms, to different environment. But uh, you know, we, have, we are talking about one species, Laos. They all have the same common, but they became so specialized for different parts of our body. Okay, that's pretty much that what he's saying. Different individuals within a species became specialized for occupying different components of the environment, which is human host. Okay. By seeking and using a very specific habitat in a single geographic area, again, uh, elaborating on top one, uh, different populations achieve sufficient physical and adaptive separation uh, to evolve reproductive barriers. Okay. For example, your, uh, uh, your, what he's talking about there, your, uh, the pubic lice cannot breed with the head lumps. That does not happen. Even though they both are louse, but they cannot breed among themselves. The pubic lice and head louse cannot breed. Examples of sympatric speciation, uh, sculpins, uh, lake, uh, these are examples of them. Okay, I talked about the parasites. This is a lake, had different species within it, pretty much like the parasites, uh, may evolve within their host species. Um, form a uh, another example of this. Can you give me another example of this besides the Laos? Anybody? Hookworms. Do you remember? Hookworms for human. We have Nicator americanus and um, and Celastema duodenale. Two different hookworms. Okay, but again, they evolved. They came from a common hookworm. They evolved to different species. So they are, these are the example of sympatric. There are a few examples that you studied in this class. Um, from, from one third to one half of the plant uh, species show sympatric evolution using uh, polyploidy, uh, which those of you who are into uh, know. Sometimes reproductive uh, distinctness uh, of a different population is not well documented. Okay, the other one is para. Uh, parapatric um, speciation that is that is different than the other two than sympatric and allopatric speciation okay this is parapatric and what is parapatric is something in between between sympatric and allopatric speciation okay so uh, parapatric geographically intermediate species between allopatric here we go allopatric and sympatric and then this is a grass that I found uh, online, and I put it on here. It's, a, it's, it's an example of uh, parapatch. Two species are separated by their geographical ranges, but they uh, make contact uh, along a borderline that neither species successfully crosses. And I will explain that. Uh, it can be due to environmental conditions that uh, splits the geographic range of the species into two environmentally distinct but geographically ad uh, adjusted. For example, you have these organisms, these two populations right here. You have these two populations right here. The organisms in this population do not breed among themselves. And the organisms in this population do not breed among themselves. There is a barrier between them. Land, water, what, and what have you. What happens at parapatric speciation, species from here, they go here and breed with these guys. 
Am I making sense? Two separate populations, but they don't breed among themselves. They breed with a neighboring population. I hope I'm making some sense. And that's, that is an example of the um, uh, parapatch. And the best example I could find online for you guys was this grass. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, the evidence, Darwin's evidence, adaptive radiation, we did talk about that. Uh, here, you all know what that is. When organisms evolve from a common ancestor to different environmental niche, it's called adaptive radiation. Evolution of several ecologically diverse species, ecologically diverse species, the one in the ocean, the one on land, the one on shallow water, deep water, okay, common ancestor of species within a short geological time interval. Uh, new lakes, and he's giving you some examples, uh, new opportunities for organisms to settle and evolve. Early settlers, he's not talking about, he's not talking about the settlers in the United States. He's talking about species who came to a new environment and there was no competition. Who were under heavy, uh, they were under heavy competition before now and now there are no competition. Geographical isolation is two places ago uh, before uh, speciation. Okay, gradualism it is something that Darwin proposed. It's one of the things that Darwin proposed and um, right now, most scientists, I, quit, I talk about it a little bit, and then we'll go see what the PowerPoint has. What Darwin said, he said, okay, the organisms in a population gradually evolved to another organism. Nowadays, based on the fossil records again, based on the fossil records, they say, no, that's not Darwin made a mistake there. It's very controversial, if you will. Nowadays they say, okay, organism, one organism quickly mutated, changed, okay, evolved, and then it stayed the same in the environment. Am I making sense? The outcome is same. The end product is same. But Darwin said gradually things changed. Nowadays, scientists are saying, no, it quickly changed, and then those characteristics, those traits, stayed in the environment for a long time. Which one is true? I guess we have to wait for the next edition. Okay, so let's see. Darwin's theory of gradualism is based on accumulation of small changes over time, which lead to a different major form of life, as I talked about. Okay. <coughs> the accumulation of quantitative change leads to qualitative change. Agreed with Lyle's uh, uniformism that past change do not depend on catastrophic events not seen today. Natural population have small continuous changes in affinity phenotypes that can accumulate over millions of years. Again, this is very controversial. Natural selection, uh, pretty much uh, what Darwin proposed, uh, the whole theory of uh, evolution that uh, Darwin proposed can be summarized in two words, as I said, natural selection. Natural selection is the major process for evolution and provides natural uh, explanation uh, for original adaptation. Uh, developmental, behavioral, anatomical, all of these. Developmental, behavioral, anatomical. For example, one example of developmental you saw today that the we human, and I'll show you some pictures, we human have gills, right? And uh, fishes have gills. We had a common ancestor. The chordate animals, right? The five characters of chordate animals. We do not have gills now, but during our development, we had gills. During our development, we had notochord. During our development, we had post anal tail. Of course, right now it's shrink. We still have it, but we do not have gills anymore, right now. But when I was in my mother's womb, I had gills, right? Okay, so that's developmental, behavioral, what kind of behavior do organisms have? King, uh, not the king, a queen, and the uh, drones. Right? Those are behavioral, uh, reproductive behavioral. Um, uh, some animals, uh, vertebrate animals, they have hair. Those are all behavioral characteristics. Anatomical, I showed you a picture of anatomical, physiological traits and enhances organisms' ability to survive and reproduce. Darwin's theory of natural selection consists of five observations. Let's go over that. Mm -hmm. I already went over it once, but let's go over it one more time 
and, uh, and, and three inferences. You all know what inference means. When you draw a conclusion from something, from an observation you make, uh, observation is a fact, and inference, I say, okay, because of this, this happened. Okay, here it is. There are five observations, one, two, three, four, and five. Based on these three observations, he came up with this inference. And based on these three, one inference and two observations, he came up with this inference, and that inference, he came up with that inference. That's pretty much what Darwin proposed. Okay, let's go over. Darwin proposed, as I said at the beginning, organisms have great potential of fertility which permits exponential growth of population. Okay? Organisms, you know, ants, they lay, uh, let's talk about parasites. Parasites that we study, they lay thousands of eggs. Thousands of eggs. But not those thousands of eggs will become all adult. You saw them throughout the semester, what barriers they have to go through. Okay, they have to find the right host, they have to find the right intermediate host, there is a barrier. But they lay thousands of eggs, that's what that number one is. Not necessarily all thousands of those eggs become adult organisms. Okay. The second observation, natural population normally do not increase exponentially. They have exponential ability to produce eggs, parasites. I'm talking about things that we did talk about in here. But not necessarily all of those eggs are going to become adult. Okay? So that's the second observation he made, Darwin. Natural population normally do not increase exponentially, but remain fairly constant. You might say, I mean, what happened to population of human? It's different. We are different. We, the population of human, were a constant until 1900. 1900, 1901, 1902, 1903, we are going exponentially off the chart. Okay? So maybe that would be the cause of our extinction. Okay, so natural resources are limited, of course. When uh, tapeworms, you remember? Tapeworms, I'm referring to examples that, that, is, that you're familiar with. Tapeworms, how many tapeworms do you have in your gut? One. Only one. But you, eat, you keep eating the eggs or you keep the sister circus, you keep eating it, you still have one tapeworm. Not true with nematodes, okay? So, the population here is controlling itself. Not true with other, all of species. So natural resources, oh, natural resources are limited. For tapeworm, he's saying that's limited for me. I wish it was true for, if you have tapeworm, it does not let the hookworms establish themselves. I wish that was true, but that's not true. Okay, so the natural resources, that's a fact. We think, I told you, my earth, we are abusing it, we are not using it. And some people have the mentality of, ah, it's unlimited, let's use it. I don't think so. But anyhow. Uh, then, based on these three, Darwin came up with that one. A struggle for existence occurs. Natural resources. Same species. Fight among same species. Okay, for uh, struggle occurs amongst uh, organisms in a population. You and I struggle. The, the sources are not unlimited in an environment. Okay? Most environment, except when you're introducing a new population to a new environment, like the uh, giant uh, uh, tortillas. Uh, tortillas. <laughs> that, uh, that dogs. But anyhow, so another observation variation occurs among organisms with a population again. Remember this, Darwin did not know anything about genetics, but he knew there is different genetic variation. He knew there is differences between me and him. Okay, so the genetic variation, he knew that. And then variation is heritable. Those variations he referred, he transmitted to his offspring and I transmitted to my offspring. And then based on these three, one inference and two observers, the varying organisms show differential survival and reproduction favoring advantageous traits. And that's what pretty much survival of the fittest is all about, right here. 
and then based on that reference, inference one natural selection, refers to natural selection, uh, acting uh, can, uh, can go over many uh, generations, gradually produces new adaptations and new species, and of course, survival of the fittest is carrying on, going on to the future generation. Natural selection has two uh, part processes, random component, random production of variation among organisms, mutation of course is another thing. Darwin did not know anything about mutation. Um, he knew population changes, but he did not toss the word mutation. Mutation we learn it later on does not potentially generate favorable traits. Non-random ones, survival, survival of different traits depending on environment or resources, and also called sorting, which is a differential survival and reproduction among uh, various organisms. Challenges to natural selection. So uh, these are the ideas that uh, the flaws that they found in Darwin's uh, theories. One of them is orthogenesis. The definition of orthogenesis is the one that I put in small print. I don't think you have it in your PowerPoint, but uh, if I ask a question, uh, you can look it up and put it up. I thought I put the definition in here. Uh, a theory that uh, variation in, uh, in evolution follows a particular direction and are not merely uh, sporadic and accidental. The question, as far as evolution goes, the, uh, what, um, what Darwin was saying and what the orthogenesis is saying, who, what is driving that evolution? What is driving that population forward that is directional. It's not, it's not <clears throat> as I said, it's not sporadic, it's not accidental that these organisms are evolving more and more and more, and eventually they will go extinct. So if it is not sporadic, if it is not accidental, what is it? <clears throat> and that's what orthogenesis is. Okay, something is propelling that population forward to evolve more. Human population is evolving more and more and more. I think one of the things that I think, what is we are evolving, we are not physically evolving anywhere, our mentality is evolving. I compare the kids of younger generation, when I was growing up, with kids now, the kids now are super smarter. I don't know, it's because of computers, because of what? Generation to the next generation to the next generation, our ability of thinking, multiple tasking, multiple mentality, the same thing happening in the brain is increasing. And that's what that is. That is propelling our population forward. It's not a physical. I know we are running, we are running 10, 100 meter less than 10 seconds. I, I, I proposed that question in here. Where is, where is it going to end? Are we ever going to run? The human are going to run 100 meters in one second? I doubt it. It never happens, to, in my mind. But our mentality is propelling forward. I, that's, that's the one I'm tossing. OK, direct and very available. That's what orthogenesis is elaborating on. It. He did not give you the definition. I gave you the definition. OK, directional variations has momentum that forces a lineage, as I said, a lineage, to evolve in a particular pattern that is not always adaptive. That's not always uh, has been before. Natural selection cannot generate new structures or sporadic uh, or species, but can only modify old ones. Okay, that's what natural selection is all about. It all modified the old generations. Exaptations, the utility of structures for a biological rule that was not part of the structures evolutionary uh, evolved. I talked about this a little bit, vestigial. Uh, Darwin's theory, uh, weaknesses of Darwin's theory, of course, I said that several times. Darwin um, um, did not know mechanism of inheritance. Uh, Mendel, uh, you've all heard of Mendel, right? Mendel came up with uh, inheritance, uh, the laws of genetics, and Darwin and Mendel, what they proposed, it was ironically, or coincidentally, it was at the same time. Darwin did not know anything about Mendel. Mendel did not know about anything about Darwin, and they proposed both of their findings at the same time, 1859 or so, they both proposed it. So inheritance as a blending of uh, parental traits, that's what 
he saw inheritance as a got it from parents. Whatever parents was, the office being got it with some modifications. Gauri noticed that, but he couldn't explain it. He couldn't explain the genetics of it. But believe, believe that our organism uh, could alter its hereditary through use and disuse of uh, parts of following Lamarckism. Environment has direct uh, influence on body parts. I guess Wiseman revised Darwin's theory of evolution. And he said, okay, and he, he called it new Darwinism. He put genetics, it was after Darwin. August Wiseman came after Darwin in early 1900, and he put the idea of genetics and idea of evolution together, and he called it new Darwinism, which eventually that new Darwinism become, became uh, synthetic theory of evolution. Synthetic theory of evolution is what Darwin and Mendel said together. Yes? Um, why is it weak? Because back up the point, or? He, we, number one, he did not know about uh, genetics. That's why we consider it as a, he could not explain what we can explain now. We could, he could not explain it. Uh, just like Lamarck. Lamarck, Lamarckism was very weak because he could not explain what Darwin was explaining. Okay, Lamarck said just the draft snake evolved became taller, but how, why? He couldn't explain those. Darwin said some of the stuff, but he could not explain it. That's why we consider it as a weak. Those ideas were weak. He said stuff, but he could not support it. Now, we can support them by genetics, whatever he said. Okay, uh, so emergence of modern Darwinism, but they did not give credit to Wiseman they, they don't call it Wisemanism. They're calling it still Darwinism because he proposed them, and now we are finding it more and more and more to support his ideas, except except uh, gradualism. He proposed gradualism, and that is a lot of people don't believe in it. Evolution did not happen gradually. A lot of people say it happened quickly. Gradually, you're talking about 10 million years.